Well, we just got started with this series, and already it's over. That's how fast time flies. The battle with ADDGT. I was tempted to keep on going down through the alphabet, but probably should just stop there and move on to the next series next Sunday morning. ADDGT. The battle. It's an acronym that I kind of just put together. Stands for anxiety. Stands for discouragement. Stands for desert places that we find ourselves in. And last Sunday, I talked about the battle with grief. Today, we end and cap it all off by speaking about T-R-O-U-B. I'm from the East. I can't spell very well. T-R-O-U-B-L-E spells Trouble. Trouble. I want to read to you the text that I've chosen for this series. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verses 1 to 4, just as the reference to the battles that we've been promised. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. When you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies, but do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them, for the Lord your God is the one. Oh, we better say it together. Can you say it with me? Verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. The promise of battles, but also the promise of victory that God will give. So Lord, this morning, I want to surrender my tongue my words, my thoughts, and God, bring it under your leadership. You would direct, you would speak, because God, I know there are people here this morning that have trouble, battling with trouble. God, I pray your spirit would speak loud and clear, and I pray there be life transformation. In his name we ask it, amen, amen. So the scripture I've chosen for this particular message is found in Job chapter 14 and verse 1. Job says these words. He said, mortals born of woman are of few days, and he says they are full of trouble. Job, what do you know about trouble? Job, what makes you think that you're qualified to talk about trouble? the word trouble. Do you know what you're speaking about? Do you know what you're saying? Well, let's find out. Let's just find out. Job chapter 14, or chapter 1. Let's go back to Job chapter 1, and we read in verses 13 to 22. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. That's trouble. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Okay, someone else comes in with more trouble for me. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put their servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Oh, my goodness, trouble. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, and when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Now, we're talking family. Now we're talking 
We are real deep, deep, deep trouble. This is flesh and blood. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and he said, Naked, I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Okay, Job, I get the picture. When you said that life is filled with trouble, you are qualified. You're qualified to make that statement because you've lived it. Because you know what you're speaking about. You understand it. Sometimes we, we go to people and we, and, or someone comes to you and says, tries to help you in your trouble. You want to know, are they qualified? Do they know what I'm going through? And many times we, we, we say they don't have a clue what I'm faced with because they've not gone through it themselves. Job says, I've been through the waters. If you were to type in the word trouble in the Google search bar, you'd get 598 million results. Taylor Swift sang a song entitled, I Knew You Were Trouble. There are 101 songs with the word trouble in it. There's even a band named Trouble. They broke up in 1996 because of trouble. Recently, I read, they, recently they got back together, I read. In 1970, there was a song released, A Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Paul Simon wrote it. Art Garfunkel sang it. It was number one in the United States for six weeks. It won award after award after award, and we still are familiar with it today. Why? Because everyone can identify with trouble. Maybe that's one reason why it was such a big hit. I identify with it. Trouble, pain. Would it be great if we could just find a bridge that would take us over the troubled waters? Take me over. Over. But sometimes we just can't get or find a bridge over the troubled waters. Sometimes we've got to swim through our troubled waters. Sometimes we've got to wade through our troubled waters. And sometimes our clothes are, are waterlogged and our boots are leaking and they get heavy and we've got to try to get through it. Sometimes there's just is no bridge over our troubled waters. Trouble is a battle that links us all together. And so we're going through some troubles and we think, well, if I could just win the lottery. I could get out of my trouble. Maybe that's my escape hatch. Go well, buy lottery tickets. I'm glad you brought that up. I read recently a, a lottery winner, and he said, oh, if I'd have just tore up that lottery ticket instead of cashing it in. And it was millions. Because he said, I've had nothing but trouble ever since I won that money. Everything in my life just fell apart. Trouble. We think somehow money's going to solve it. And so we buy ticket after ticket thinking if I just win the big one, my troubles will vanish wrong. Money will never satisfy. Money will never get you out of your troubles. Never. I always jokingly say to my wife, I never buy lottery tickets. You know why? I say to my wife in a joking way, because my luck I'd probably win. And it would just ruin and destroy my life. Do yourself a favor. Save your money. There's a 1970s song. I'm actually doing a lot of song quotes today for some reason. 1970s song had these words in it. You've got your troubles, and I got mine. Hmm. Well, it's 1978. You know, there are times in our lives when there are Little snapshots of episodes in our lives that stand out, and we always remember them. This is one of them for me. It's 1978. I'm working in Marathon, Ontario, in a pulp and paper mill, and I'm in the wood yard. It's raining. And if it wasn't, it's wet anyways, because where I was working, I was at the end of this conveyor belt. It was actually driven by chains that would take the pulp 
wood to the mill. And as it's changing from one direction to another, at the exchange, there's lots of bark falling off, and it builds up. And so my job was to stand there with a shovel and to shovel the bark away. And I remember this, shoveling this bark. I've got a yellow rain coat on, a yellow rain hat. There's water all over the place. I'm shoveling this bark, and I'm troubled because things are going through my mind. God, where am I going with my life? What will I become in my life? What will I do? And I, I remember being so deeply troubled. That snapshot remains in my mind. Jump ahead now to 1983. Took my first church. It was a troubled church. No other pastor would go there. I put up my hand, I'll go. But it was a troubled church. A troubled church. I, I could preach to you a sermon series. It could be a series entitled, My Troubled Waters and the Bridge is Out. Or My Troubled Waters and I Can't Find the Bridge. I mean, I have had the uncomfortable medical procedures like you have had. And I've had to wait for the results like you have had. We'll call you in three days. Come back in for the results. I know what it's like. Been there. One time, let me give you one little illustration. One time I had to go to Winnipeg. And I go to this doctor's office and the music is playing, peaceful, relaxing music. Come on in, sit down. She was very calm, sat down, and she says, we're going to put a tube in your nose and it's going to go right down to your stomach. But you just relax. It's all going to be good. The music, it really was relaxing. So I sat down, she put this, tube that was about the size of this in my nose. I'm lying. It wasn't that big. But it felt that way. And I want to say that it was huge. So she put this tube in my nose. It goes down to my stomach. And speaking of that, I was starting to get pretty hungry in my stomach. I had to wait. And so then I said to my wife after that, I'm hungry. I got to go eat. So went to Tim Hortons. Now, get a picture. I walk into Tim Hortons. And I have this tube sticking out of my nose. And it comes out of my nose, goes over my ear, comes back down here with a big piece of tape here, and goes into a meter here that's kind of reading things. But I'm so hungry, I don't care. So I walk into Tim Hortons. Guess what people do? They look at me. Well, I'm hungry. And I don't know what came over me. I just said in a loud voice, I know, I know. I actually said that. My wife's embarrassed. But guess what? End of trouble. People put their heads down pretty quick. No one looked at me. They're probably scared to even be around me. I know. I know. Trouble. We all have our stories, don't we? And so Job said, life is filled with trouble. Days are short. Troubles are many. So Job knows about grief. Job knows about bad news. Job knows about physical pain. Job knows about losing friends. Job knows about material loss. Job knows about loneliness. He knows about being misunderstood. He knows about wrestling with God when he doesn't understand God. In Job 13, verse 28, he says he feels like he's wasting away, like something rotting, and like a garment being eaten up by moths. He said, this is how I feel. Job 14, 7, he says, at least there is hope for a tree. For if a tree is cut down, at least it will sprout again. King Hezekiah said, this is the day of trouble. 2 Kings 19, verse 3. Solomon said, remember your creator before the days of trouble begin. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Numbers chapter 11, verse 10, it says that Moses was troubled. Why? They're in the wilderness. No food. Complaining in the wilderness. Nothing there. And so Moses, I'm, I'm troubled over these complaining people. 
Hannah said, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. She wanted a baby so bad. Couldn't have one at that time. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to God all night long. First Samuel 15 verse 11 tells us. Asaph said, I was too troubled to speak. Let me give you some more. Apostle Paul had trouble with prisons and people. Daniel had trouble with lions. David had trouble with his family and his kingdom. Elijah had trouble with false prophets and depression. Noah had trouble with unbelieving people. Nehemiah had trouble with his enemies trying to stop the work of God. Let me give you a story of your life. Let me talk to you about every person here this morning. Let me tell you something about you. When you were very, very, very young, a difficulty came into your life. Oh, you were surprised. But you brushed it off. I don't know how old you were, but you were young. And then another difficulty came in. Again, you were surprised. It was getting harder to brush it off. Then another one, then another one, and then another one, and then another one. Soon you realize life and trouble go together. They do. Job was right. Life is full of trouble. So what do you do? What do you do with this reality? Well, being that this is the time, or we've been talking a lot about the media, you and I together talking about the eclipse. It's become part of our everyday language, so I thought I'd throw this into my sermon this morning. You know what you do with your troubles? You eclipse them. You eclipse them. Number one, you need to eclipse your troubles with a springboard. These are so simple. You need to, in your mind, I was going to bring a springboard here, but it's just too heavy. Pick up that springboard and eclipse your troubles. Eclipse them. You know why? Because that can be your launching pad. That's your launching pad. That is why you can eclipse your troubles with a springboard. Tommy Barnett went to a pastor's conference one time for pastors, and, and there was a room filled with pastors, and they, the speaker said, tonight, or whatever the session, whatever it was, I'm going to speak to you about what makes a church great. And so all the pastors were excited to hear, he's going to talk about what makes a church great. So they were all there. They got their pens out. They got the notepads out. And the speaker came to the platform. He said, I'm going to tell you what makes a church great. Here's what makes a church great. It's trouble. And then he walked off the platform. Probably got an honorarium for it. <laughs> wow. That's what makes a church great. But that is what makes you great. That is what makes us great. Trouble can play a major role in your growth and your maturity. How does a tree become stronger? By the wind blowing. The stronger the wind, the deeper the roots. It's called trouble in the form of wind. Oh, it's not the pleasanties of life that makes a person great. It's adversity. It's pain. It's hardships. Before God used many of the past great revivalists like Smith Wigglesworth, as I've read them and their lives, their biographies, I've read that they've gone through trouble, heartache, and pain, and grief. That is what made them great. That is what enabled God to flow through them and to use them. Maturity happens. Growth happened. A deepening in the faith and determination to serve God happens. A springboard. That's what it was. The launching pad. See, if it had not been for trouble, 
many inventions would not have been made. Let me give you an example. Thomas Edison, he changed his world by 40 years of age. Changed his world. Thomas Edison invented, of course, the light bulb. But not just that. There are many other inventions. But he's known as America's greatest inventor. He held 1,093 patents to his name. But let's go back a little bit. His father thought he was stupid. Trouble. He was fired from a job. He had... Hearing problems, trouble. He saw his laboratory blow up and burn to the ground. As a side note, here's what he said to his son. As his laboratory blew up and fire is sweeping through it and it's burned to the ground, he said, quick, quick son, run and get your mother because she's never going to see a fire like this one again. He came round out to see the fire. She'll never see a fire like this. Wow. But you see, trouble can be a springboard. Difficulties. He tried so many different things. Things didn't work and that this did work. Trouble actually made these great inventions. Trouble can make you. Trouble can make me. Trouble can grow you. Trouble can take you into uncharted territory, places you've never been. And when you look back, you say, I've grown through this. I've grown through that trouble, grown through that pain. Yes, I believe you can eclipse your troubles with a big springboard. Let it pass over in front of your trouble. Number two, you can eclipse your troubles with the right pair of glasses. Yes. With the right pair of glasses, I'm talking about correct vision. Correct vision. I didn't have the right glasses on the day of the eclipse. It was on a Monday. Didn't have the right glasses on. And before Monday morning came, my wife was kept warning me over and over again, don't look at the sun. Don't. She must love me or something. Don't look at the sun. So I couldn't. I wanted to obey my wife. So Monday morning comes. It's close to the hour. She texts me, don't look at the sun. She phones me, don't look at the sun. She's interrupting my sermon preparation, because Monday's my sermon day, with thoughts of love and compassion and caring. And I loved every bit of it. Don't look at the sun. I've learned that you need to look at your troubles with the right lenses. Because what you see is what you will get. Amen? What you see is what you will get. Vision is so important. We need to block trouble out with something bigger. Let me give you some examples you need to see that today, God has a plan for your life. You need to see today that nothing happens to you by chance. Nothing. You need to see today that God will never, ever leave you or forsake you. That's the correct lens. You need to see that today, all things we got to say it together. Say it with me. All things work together for good. Not bad. Before you were a believer, they worked against you. But now that you're a believer, you're a saint of God, child of the king, everything works for you. That is correct lens. That's seeing properly. You need to see today that God will get you through. You need to see today that you reside in the palms of Jesus' hands. What a place to be. See it. You need to see today that God can be trusted. You need to see today that even in the desert, like I said last Sunday, there can be desserts. 
That is correct vision. That's having proper glasses so you can put that vision over and eclipse your troubles with correct vision. I know these things about today. I know these things about the present. I know these things about the moment, you can say, because I've got the right vision. And not only that, not only that, but you need to see that tomorrow God will give you eternal life. If you think this is it, you're missing it all. This is not it. This is the preliminaries. This is temporary. This temple that I got is just, it's going to pass away. The older I get, the shorter I'm getting, the closer I'm getting to the grave. But you are too. So don't laugh. All of us are. This is not the final showdown. In trouble, present troubles that you're facing, you've got to see that there is eternal life. You need to see that what is being created and built for you right now is a mansion. A place where there will be no more trouble. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more grief. No more anxiety. No more tears. No more nights. That sounds pretty good to me. And when you get that perspective, and when you have that vision, that corrective lens, that you can eclipse your troubles by realizing, I can make it today, and I've got an incredible future ahead of me. Boy, I think that'll help you going through your troubles when you realize, oh, there's a great day coming. There's coming a rapture. There's coming in the clouds the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back someday. And he loves me so much that he's going to, I'm going up in the rapture. Okay. Second thing you can do is eclipse your troubles with the right pair of glasses. Speaking of that, I'm going to have a drink of water. Number three, here's a suggestion when you've got troubles. Eclipse your troubles with a big bag of sugar. Now I've really lost my mind, haven't I? I said, this is so simple, this is so simple, it is so simple. I'm going to talk about just adding sweetness. Just a spoonful of sugar. Helps the medicine go down. And some of that medicine tastes terrible. But just a spoonful of sugar helps that medicine go down. Buckley's is just terrible, isn't it? Terrible. When life hands people a lemon, they go ahead and eat it. Not all people, some people. They didn't have to eat it. But when life hands you a lemon, it's your choice. Lemons are sour. And so when you eat that lemon, disposition becomes sour. Your countenance becomes sour. Your speech becomes sour. Your attitude becomes sour. Your outlook becomes sour. But you see, no one has to eat that lemon. On some packages we read, just add water. I'm saying you just need to add sugar. So when there's any, the troubles are there. Bring up a big bag of sugar. My wife said, do you want a big bag of sugar for church this morning? I said, no, I won't this time. Because if I did that, I have to bring a springboard in and, you know, all these other things that they get too big. But just picture a big bag of sugar. You are eclipsing your troubles with the sweetness. Now I want to take you back in time. Remember the lemonade stands when you were a child? Oh, when you were just a little tyke. I did it, you did it. We, I did it back in Nova Scotia. You did it out here in Manitoba or wherever you live. We all did it and sat there with big smiles on our faces and we sold lemonade. I want you to think now. How many adults, I wonder, was walking 
down the street and they saw our little smiles and sitting there, 25 cents or whatever it was. I know we could have got more if we just charged more because adults can't say no to little children that are smiling. But how many adults are walking down with troubles and a lemonade stand? They see our big smiles and they go and they pay the money and they get this lemonade and they drink it. I wonder how many people forgot about their troubles for a little bit. Do you know something? We never thought of selling lemon juice, did we? No. We sold lemonade. We put sugar. And we ate it sweet. We didn't want them to drink it. Oh, we want them to drink it. Oh, it's so sweet. And if we could just add sugar to our troubles, I believe it'll make it, it would make a difference. In Philippians chapter 1, life handed Paul, the apostle, one of the greatest missionaries of all time. Life handed him a lemon. The devil wanted to, for him to eat that lemon. Paul, eat that lemon. Because if you'll just eat that lemon, your disposition will change. Your character will change. Your, your uh, usefulness for God will change into doing nothing for God. Eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. Oh, you've been beaten, Paul? You've been imprisoned, Paul? You've been chained. You've been scarred. you suffered. Paul, you're full of trouble. Don't you think the enemy was tempting the great apostle Paul? Of course he was, just as he tempts us. Paul, eat the lemon. And so Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul writing to the Philippians, he starts out this scripture by saying, the things that happened to me. Do you think? This is where my mind went this past week. The things which happened to me. I'm just kind of sharing this in a way that I understand it and you and I can understand it. I wonder if he paused. The things which happened to me. You see, that could have gone sour pretty fast. The things which happened to me. Shipwreck, hunger, running away, difficulty, pain, struggle. It could have went south in a hurry. The things which happened to me. Let me continue. Rather has gone on to actually serve to advance the gospel. Paul added sugar to trouble. And he made lemonade. Oh, that made the enemy so mad. I wanted him defeated. I wanted him to, to shut up and to stop sharing the good news. But Paul, he just took this lemon and he made lemonade out of it. He goes on to say, I've actually shared Jesus with many people in jail. And the enemy said, if I can just shut his mouth, if I can just get him discouraged, but in that jail, he starts sharing Jesus. And then he goes on in the rest of the Philippians to talk about, really is a, a whole, his whole perspective now is sugar-coated. He talks about Christ being preached. He talks about Christ being exalted in his body. He says, for me to live as Christ and to die, is, that's just gain. That's better yet. He said, for that reason, I'm not sure what I want to do. Do I want to stay here and go to heaven? I don't know. I'm going to straight betwixt two. He goes on to tell the believers in the church to have the mind of Jesus. He goes on to tell the believers in Philippi to do everything without grumbling, to live with a spirit of humility. He goes on to tell them, stand firm. He goes on to tell them, shine as the stars. He says, keep pressing on. And he tells them to forget about the past. Wow. You bet. Paul added sugar to the lemon and made lemonade. 
and told others to do the same. Oh, make lemonade out of your troubles. Get a big bag of sugar and stand it up and get it in front of your troubles and let it eclipse it. I don't know, it sounds good to me. Lastly, fourthly, eclipse your troubles with the power of good choices. Here's what I know about choices. They will determine, choices will determine where you go and who you will become. That's the power of choices. Choices will determine where you'll be in five years, where you'll be in 10 years. Choices will determine how you look in five years, in 10 years. Choices. Choices. Choices, what they do is they set a person in motion. And so sometimes we're in, in the valley of indecision. We're not sure what to do, but when we make a choice, we start moving. So we make a choice. Which way are we moving? To the left or to the right? To the front? To behind? Choices set you in motion. Good or bad, the power will always flow where the attention goes. You need to make good choices because there are power, there's power in those choices that you make. Choices can make you better or they can make you bitter. Choices can make you happy or they can make you just plain miserable. Choices can make you sleep well at night or they can make you stay up all night. Choices can make you stressed or they can make you relaxed. The power of a choice. Isn't it amazing how powerful they are? So the choice is yours. The choice is mine. And somehow I pray that this message has helped you through trouble. Whatever it is, because for all of us, they come in different shapes and sizes, but we all know what it's like to face trouble. So my prayer is that you would leave today realizing that you can eclipse them, not by yourself, but Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. A little side note, if you continue on reading in the book of Job, it says that God blessed Job's life more at the end than at the beginning. That's not always the way it is. Sometimes we just go into eternity, and there's the ultimate blessing. But I'm just saying that God has a word for you and the troubles you go through. And that God can make us victorious. And so, Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. We invited the presence of the Holy Spirit at the very beginning. We invited you to work in our lives. We invited you to speak to our hearts. And God, I know you have. And I pray, God, as we leave this facility, that we, we would leave with a new determination. Because sometimes the troubles don't change overnight, and sometimes we can't find the bridge. If you will not take us over the trouble, you'll take us through the trouble. We believe that. And for that, we give you all praise, all worship. Amen. Stand with me as we close in prayer today and sing a song together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust 
the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through 